boys in the household as the only female in the household. Strong men. We love you, Mom. We love you. Good afternoon. I, st I stand here giving all praises to God. We are so overwhelmed with the love and support that we feel at this moment from everyone who has supported us on our journey. I just wanted, I had a lot prepared, but I'm gonna throw it out the window. <laughs> um, I just wanted you to know a few things about the man, Alonzo Tambor Moody, that you may not know. I'll begin with his um, teen years. He, uh, well, we grew up together as Protestants in Central Presbyterian Church on Ward Street. He, he was a few years older than me, and as he attended Central High School, I was also at Central for one year. I watched him from afar. I was attracted to him, tall, athletic, his first love was basketball, which he played for hours every day. Actually, he was a very good player. He was scoring 28 points a game, which was unheard of in the 60s. And I, to this day, I can't bring him away from the basketball court. <laughs> he was, um, he graduated uh, Central High School, now Kennedy High School, and he graduated on a Wednesday, and on a Saturday, he got his letter from the draft. He was going straight into the Vietnam War. Um, for those of you that are young, you probably don't know what the draft is, but it's been an inactive for every war that the United States has been in. It's a lottery system. Men ages 18 to 25, they had to register the selective service, and then they were called upon. I can't imagine what his family felt when he was drafted so quickly. But I thought I would never see him again once he went into the armed services. He was drafted into the army, but he chose to go into the Air Force. At, the, at those times, you know, I said, okay, he's gone. I won't see him again. And I don't know if he knew how I felt because I watched him with all the other girls in high school. He was a true jock. <laughs> but um, his years in the service, one of those years, he had a chance encounter with Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael was there at one of the universities to speak to the Black Student Union. And he pulled Alonzo to the side, I think it was destiny, and he said, brother, um, have you read the autobiography, autobiography of Malcolm X? And he replied, no. He said, don't you know what's happening on the mainland in the United States? You know, our people are fighting. And he said, well, you promise me that you will read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And he did. And that set him on a road to being an activist in his own right. In, in the early 1970s, 1970, we married. We married in the church that we grew up in. And our wedding was not unlike coming to America. It was an African-inspired wedding. And uh, people, I guess, were curious to see what this wedding was like. But we also did the Christian vows as well. But we wrote our vows and I guess it was something in him and in me that said, you know, we, could, we have to make things better. 
we vowed to our congregation that we would use our, our abilities and our energy to make our community a better place to live. And that has stuck with us. Even after we married as a young couple, we had our first child, Malik, and uh, he wasn't even a year old. And we began to travel to Newark, to the Committee for Unified Newark, under the auspices and leadership of Imamu Amir Baraka, known as Leroy Jones. If you know him, he was a prolific writer, poet, activist, and um, we liked what was going on in Newark. So we represented the cadre from Patterson. There were cadres all over Philly. We were all studying Kawaida and a philosophy of African ways to build and thrive. And with that in our back pocket, um, we began to work in other ways. We had, uh, we would meet in Neighborhood House on Graham Avenue. It's my husband and I and some friends uh, that have probably most have moved away. Where? Oh, yes. And we felt that the only way for black people to make any progress in this country was to unify the first principle of Kwanzaa, Umoja. And we began by looking at politics. We supported John Bell, who ran for mayor, he didn't win. We supported Martha Fetze, Martha Bowles of Fetze, who's a great educator, who, had, who built a school here in Patterson to the third grade, excellent school. Our three sons attended that school, and she's listening and watching now because we talk frequently. She moved to her home in the South. But with her blessings, you know, we wanted to, our children to have the, the best of everything, the best in education, the best in social skills, you know, the best in their commitment to do better and to make their community better, just like their mother and father. I think we kind of succeeded, didn't we? <laughs> Yes, yes. And not just for our children, but for all children, all children. And you know, a lot of teachers will say, these are my children. Yes, they are your children. And we decided to, which we didn't know when we got married, that there was a children's haven home here in Patterson for abandoned, abused, and neglected children. Our church, many were on the board, they started this home. And it, if you wanna know about diversity, all you had to do was come to Children's Haven. We had children of every nationality, every race, and they worked in harmony. And it wasn't an easy place to live because we expected much of them. We had chores, you know, we had, rules, negative and positive consequences. And my husband will probably say more about that. And these men who are saying they will work to death. Well, I, I tell my husband, don't you know there are child labor laws that exist? They would get up at five in the morning in the winter. Yes, and go shovel elderly people's homes before they went to school. Don't run for office because they, who would they call? Moody. We have all our flyers. Moody, can you get these out into the community? Sure. He was very regimented in what part of town. The kids were dropped off at this point. They have to pick him up at the other point and be finished before time to go to school. I think it taught them character. And they were paid. So we say, you're paid. So what are you going to do with your money? We taught them to save at least 50% of their money. And many of the children that left us left with a big bank account. And they, you know, it was just training for life. That's what we did with them. And our place was the happening place in Patterson because a lot of children would come visit and we had to call the parents. They've been here for three days. Don't you want them back? <laughs> <laughs> and the girls, because it was a home for boys, as Mrs. 
hot and new. Our friend Cecile Dickey, if any of you remember her, her name is on Head Start Education Building on the east side. Fierce educator, fierce advocate for early childhood education and Head Start. And uh, she, you know, we miss her very, very much. But she was right. You have to start the kids early with their learning and give them a chance to get ahead. So, you know, she said to my husband and I, and our children at this time were six, three, and one years old. And she called us up. She said, we need house parents. We need foster parents for this group of children. And then my husband came to me. Now, I'm working full time. He says, you think we can do it? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> He says, well, you know, this is our chance. And I said, yeah, you're right. We always said if we lived with the children, we gave them love, we gave them structure, it would mean a whole different trajectory for their life. And I said, okay. So here we are in tow. We come to Children's Haven. My husband was very um, revolutionary. He had this big afro. He had the dark shades. I have my Afro, my um, African clothing, and the staff, they're like, who are these people? <laughs> but, you know, once they got to know us, they know that we meant business. And Kawisi was not even a year old when we went into Children's Haven. And they wanted, it was a home for boys and girls, but we told them, absolutely not boys and girls because now DIFUS, Division of Youth and Family Services, want to place preteen and teenagers. So of course naturally we had sons, so we said no, there must be boys. And they agreed with us. And we were only supposed to be there two or three years. The psychologist that interviewed us said, ah, if you make two years, that'll be great. We stayed 12 years. <laughs> And I thank my children because it was rough on them. We didn't make any difference between the children that were placed there and our children. We said we will not do that to them. And they had the same rules. They had the same um, demerits and restriction if they broke a rule. Um, they were rewarded. We took them everywhere. We took them to Canada. A lot of them had never been on a train ride through upstate New York. We made them map it out. We took them to three cities in Canada. We took them to Florida. None of them had never been on an airplane ride before, to Disney World. And we treated them as our own. And there's some of them here today and they could tell you themselves. We love them and we still love them to this day. And we're so proud of the work we did because now they've grown into men with families of their own who are giving back. I have one funny story because even though my husband is very serious most of the time and easygoing, stoic, he has a sense of humor. I don't have one. He says, I don't have a funny bone in my body. But this one particular night, he came home and we tried to make the home peaceful because it was just so much with 13 boys there was always something going on and he came home one night truly exhausted he was still working at the Pitsay county shelter and then he went to all of these meetings in the evening he was on every board every community group and he came and he said kimata just send my plate up to the room i said okay so i was still in the kitchen one of the boys took his tray up with his food, sat it outside the master bedroom. Now, in the second floor of that house, all the bedrooms are on the same floor. The master bedroom, the kids' rooms, and the largest bathroom. And all of a sudden, we hear this commotion. Of course, one of the boys, I'll call him Jay, who's very rambunctious, who just runs everywhere he goes. He ran into his tray and food went everywhere. 
and we were all saying, oh my God, the kids, we were all standing, what's gonna happen now, poor man? And he said, Jay, come here a minute. He says, repeat after me. I would rather run through hell in gasoline soaked drawers than to knock Mr. Moody's food on the floor. <laughs> we all burst out laughing with the image in our minds. <laughs> but he uses humor all the time with the students and the children that he worked with and with the families. And uh, I think he's just brilliant in what he does. I love him to death and I see you all love him too. <laughs> and we thank you, we're so proud, so proud of this day. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. Uh, we want to give thanks and honor appropriately. Put your hands together for our guest of honor, Mr. Alonzo Tambor Moody. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, extremely, extremely humbled by all this. And uh, I just can't thank you. I want to thank everyone, all of you who are out here, especially thanks to the Board of Education, Superintendent, Commissioners, Commissioner Capers for nominating me for this and all of those that support this. It's a very, very humbling experience and I thank you. Um, just hearing, you know, all the things again is humbling, embarrassing, seems like. <laughs> But um, I just want to say that this school, uh, the Great Falls Academy, uh, is a special kind of a situation, a special place. It really got started uh, because um, you know, we started a program called the Total Lifestyle and Support Program um, that was uh, designed and developed to reduce the number of, of uh, juveniles that was being sent to uh, prison, to Jamesburg. Um, schools, it really got kicked off in uh, 1986, but in 85, uh, the Supreme Court under the Chief Justice Wilentz had, uh, indicated, uh, directed the counties to uh, develop programs to reduce the number of juveniles that were being incarcerated. And during that time, um, <clears throat> Passaic County led the state in the number of commitments to the state home for boys and girls the last uh, 13 out of 15 years. Uh, Passaic County was sending more kids to jail then Essex County, we were sending double the number that Essex was sending, you know, and we, um, it was a tremendous amount of kids going to jail. So this Chief Justice, they said, they uh, directed the counties to develop programs that would uh, reduce that number and uh, provided uh, funds to the county. And through that, 
um, along with uh, the, uh, uh, the family court presiding judge, the family court got together and put together a proposal to do that. And so uh, the proposal called for students, uh, for juveniles that were in a situation where if we didn't take them in that program, then they would be sent to jail for a minimum of two years, two and a half years. So uh, there could not be any other alternative. So for a juvenile to be in that situation, usually, you know, it was the uh, kind of rough kids. Wasn't your regular Sunday go to meeting type of juvenile. <laughs> you know, that, that jacket was about this thick, you know. So they were hardcore. And, um, and so when they were placed in the program, or conditioned by the judge, was that they had to be in school. So those youngsters, when I would take them back to the school, try to, to re-sign them up for school, the principal says, oh, I'm coming in. Hell no, no, no. <laughs> said, no way. I couldn't put them back in the school. <laughs> and so uh, I, was, uh, I was at a, a football game with East Side with old Dr. Uh, Napier. And, uh, and we were talking. And uh, I said, Doc, you know, I can't get the kids back in school. I need, what do you mean? He said, the principal won't take them. <laughs> and they said, they won't get them back. He said, well, what do you mean? Well, well, I'll come by Monday and we'll talk and we'll see what we can do. So he came by, we were up at Grand Street at the time. And I, I had about 35 youngsters. He walked in, he said, I said, damn, I don't look like you got pretty good control of them. What if I put a teacher here? <laughs> okay, how we do it, Doc? <laughs> they need to be, you've got to be them in school. <laughs> and so he sent a teacher there. And then, you know, um, young white, first teacher was a young white woman from Mount Clare. I had a whole, a, a room full of, Thugs. <laughs> so certainly she wasn't going to manage them. <laughs> but she didn't have to manage them. We managed them. <laughs> All she had to do was teach. And so she happened to be a great teacher. So I had 35 kids, or 32 kids. Every kid is on a different level. So she had to teach all of them. And so she did an excellent job. And that was the beginning. And um, as we proceed, you know, and they saw that, so it was working. So I ended up saying, no, sending, making a whole school out of it. So, so by 1986, you know, we had uh, our staff to, to get going with it. And it continued. Now, the, uh, the other interesting thing about Great Falls Academy, um, <clears throat> all these service providers to these youngsters, we reached out and pulled them together from, you know, like from the family court to the prosecutor's office, public defender's office, probation department, DIFAS, <laughs> the schools again, uh, the uh, other social service agencies that might be involved, the housing authority, the police department, all, everybody played a part. And, and we put everybody on the page so every entity what, whenever they had interaction with the kid, they were saying the same thing. So we all saying the same thing to the youngster. I think that's what made it more effective. Um, usually kids don't, we have, adults have a hard time getting kids to listen because uh, what I learned is that everybody's saying something different. So they don't know who to follow. Yeah. <laughs> so they, so they, they don't follow nobody because everybody's saying something different. So. I learned that then we that are providing those services, we have to get on the same page and we have to say the same thing. We have to be saying the same message and that pulls them in. And the kids, they don't care how firm you are. They got a problem with how fair you are. So you could be as firm as you need to be. If you fair, they buy into you. And, and, they, and, and they support you and they follow you. And that was, that was a key behind that. But um, so the overall goals of the school 
was like, uh, in addition to teaching the, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, right, um, the school decided to focus on decision making because, you know, that's the basis, you know, your decision, you know, and um, so we, we all engage to um, work to provide those kinds of services that will inspire or get the youngster to, to, to one point. If it's about decision making, you know, there's two decisions, a negative decision and a positive decision. Well, we want you to make positive decisions because, you know, the results, you make a decision, there's a consequence. So if you make a negative decision, there's going to be a negative consequence. You don't care if you have to travel around the world and come back, but negativity is coming back to you, right? Make a positive decision, that goes back. So whatever comes back is a positive thing. So I want you, I want your consequences to be positive. For that to happen, you need to make a positive decision. So now our effort is to convince the youngster, you know, whatever decision you make, again, you know, someone mentioned before, we don't know a whole lot. You know, I say often, in terms of knowing stuff for sure and facts, you know, the difference between a fact and a belief. You know, I only know two facts. <laughs> Everybody here, that's a lot. H2O equals water. And I learned that not long ago, folks. Really. <laughs> and two, <laughs> your ass gonna die. <laughs> Everything is a belief. So just because I believe something to be true, don't mean it's true. You know, so understanding that, it makes you a little humble. So what to do, you know, telling the youngster what to do. Well, what I can say, whatever your decision is, if you ensure that it's a positive decision, you're gonna be okay. You know, and so that's, that's the, the effort, that's the effort is try to get the youngsters to make positive decisions. And then doing that, um, in the beginning, I always relied on, I said this, this was a battle, the school, you know, like getting it going. And uh, I thought about battles, see, war. And I, I was, my attention was drawn to uh, a fifth century Chinese military genius, Sun Tzu. And Sun Tzu said, he who enters the battle with the hope of victory has already lost. <laughs> wow. So he who enters the battle with the hope of victory has already lost. Well, I want to win. What do you got to do to win? <laughs> so, and then he went farther and he said, um, it's six steps to victory. Six steps to victory? He says, yes. The way work it out. First step, you have a situation. The six steps of situation, analyze, facts, analyst, plan, win. So what does that mean? So it's first thing you have a situation. The next thing you do is that you analyze that situation. Second thing, third thing you do is gather all the facts around that situation. Then you give it a second analysis. And then you develop a plan. And then he says, then you win. You don't say you go battle, he said, then you win. All right. <laughs> so if you, you follow these steps, then you win. And that's the whole thing, you know, you follow those, <laughs> those six steps and you win. So this battle, or say the Great Falls Academy of School was a battle. And followed in the Sun Tzu, we win. And so to say to the staff and teachers, it's continuous. This is a battle. You want to win. Follow six steps. You know. And um and I'm just so proud the kinds of stuff that come out and the uh the, and the folks the stuff that they contribute and do, you know, is so humbling. And that um, for all the, 
the participants, all the clients, all the students, and all the staff. Just so humbled and appreciative. And I want to thank all of you again for standing out in all this cold and all this time <laughs> for this people. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Very much. I can't leave without saying, you know, extra, extra, double extra. So thank you so much to my wife. You just don't know how much she had to put up with. So, so thank you again. Thank you very much for that wisdom. So in closing out, I want to also offer our thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. As you know, our entire family was here, our extended family, uh, my wife, uh, her mother and father, uh, my sister-in-law, my brother's here. Uh, he's wor he was working, so he, he had to come after the mayor left. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he came through. But thank you all for coming. At this time, folks, there's just one last piece of the program. Uh, we will do the, the, the traditional uh, ceremonial ribbon cutting uh, at this time. And we will have a tour of the school and the artwork that we're talking about. However, we only can go in 25 at a time and you will not want to miss that artwork that's in the side of this building. So please stick around and take a, a tour with us through the front of the building. Thank you. We also had a cheerleader from, uh, from, from uh, Mr. Moody's High School who came with her cheerleading outfit from Central High School. If any
everybody get over here. Okay, baby. Is everybody ready? Pull them down, girl. Presentation to the powerful legacy that Al Moody, Tumble of Moody, has left in the city of Patterson. We are so honored, so honored to be here in the school named after him with the excellent teachers and other staff and the principal Moody who are running a great program to change the lives of these students who many find challenging, but these, these staff members and teachers and my husband we wanted to make life better for them also. Thank you. Give it to Mr. Moody. Mr. Moody, just thank, thank everybody. Again, I, I just want to thank everyone, everyone involved with making this thing possible. And so deeply, deeply humbled by this. Um, just can't stop thinking and appreciating and expressing my gratitude for all of this. It's extremely humbling, and I want to thank everyone, everyone who's involved in this. Thank you. We will never break. We will never break. Build on our foundation. Strong enough to stay